good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending, and I'm very pleased to see you here. Um, for those of, the, of you who don't know me, my name's Professor Mark Gabbett, and I'm currently the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics here at Macquarie, and also the Pro Vice Chancellor International. Um, I'd like to uh, begin our proceedings by acknowledging the Darug people, the traditional owners of the land the university is on, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, of the Darug, and extend that respect to other Indigenous guests who are present here this evening. So, a very warm welcome to you all, and it's my privilege to MC this event with uh, Paul Clitheroe uh, this evening at this colloquium lecture series. This is the third uh, Macquarie Colloquium series event organised by Alumni Relations and has proved to be extremely popular uh, as a, a way of showcasing and highlighting the work of Macquarie's academics and associated partners and supporters back to a very important alumni group. Uh, as you all know, our speaker um, tonight is um, Paul Clitheroe. For some of you, he requires very little introduction. For some, will require a little bit. So forgive me while I do a quick pass through what is an outstanding uh, curriculum vitae of someone who's contributed towards financial literacy in Australia for many years. Um, Paul established IPAC Securities back in 1983 uh, as a company and it manages over $16 billion of funds currently. He's chairman of the Australian Government Financial Literacy Board, which sets and implements the National Strategy for Australia for Financial Literacy and has a particular focus on schools, obviously, universities, obviously, and vocational education. Uh, by the by, Paul was host of Money on Channel 9 from 1993 to 2002. He hosted Money for Jam 2009-2010 and the national radio show Money 2010 and 2011. His Talking Money segments run on radio stations all over Australia, providing clear and well-informed explanations and suggestions about money and the money world. Paul is chairman of the Australian String Quartet, the Youth Anti-Drug Driving Body, RADD, and is a board member of Philanthropy Australia and the University of Sydney Medical School. In 2011, he was nominated as Most Outstanding Thought Leader by FINSIA, the Financial Services Industry Body, and they appointed Paul a life member. He was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2008 for services to the financial service industry and the community. So welcome to Paul. Um, as part of the format for this evening, uh, we welcome your comments and questions at the end. Paul is amenable to answering questions and we'll provide two roving microphones for you. Um, so just stick your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you uh, so that everyone in the room can hear your questions. So without further delay, I'm sure you'd rather listen to Paul than listen to me. So I'd now like to invite uh, Paul Clitheroe to present his lecture entitled, Regulate or Educate? Paul. Oh, thanks very much, Mark, and uh, thanks for coming along this evening. It's a, it's a very challenging piece of subject matter tonight, and regulate versus educate sounds like reasonably simple words, but the, the actual implications of the words are, are not easy. Look, I come from obviously a, a, a mix of things. Um, you know, Mark mentioned uh, that I've been involved in the industry, but I, I should point out I, I sold my business some decade ago, and uh, since then I've been heavily involved in communicating financial literacy. Uh, I was originally appointed by the Howard government to, to head up this area and reappointed by the Gillard, uh, the Rudd government, then the Gillard government, and uh, I guess next the Tony government. But we will, we will wait and see, folks. Um, but all of them, the reason it's not a political issue is we all know full well that the world's a highly imperfect place. We, we know full well that all sorts of things are wrong. Uh, for example, we've been reading about unnecessary deaths in hospitals. We've been reading about probably something that as a, a father of three kids uh, who are now young adults, but you know, the Royal Commission uh, into child abuse. Um, there's just a lot that's wrong, uh, and I get that. I'm going to talk about some of the wrongs of money in a moment, and there's been some awful things that have happened, and we'll come to that. But why are we having, why has Macquarie University established a chair in financial literacy? Why has both the Liberal and Labor governments focusing on this subject of financial literacy. 
Uh, we've now got 100 countries around the world focusing, uh, I represent the Australian Government on the OECD. Uh, for example, the World Bank's just given Russia a $300 million grant uh, around financial literacy for its population. What's all this about? Because many of you are going, well, what's the problem? I mean, what's the issue? And I'd have to say that, that I'm nearly 58, and I accept that I, and maybe many of you, maybe not, are probably a, a little smug about money. Uh, and when we hear about the average 25-year-old Australian having $2,500 on a credit card, uh, you might have seen me on TV two weeks ago helping out a young guy called Daniel. And young Daniel's a nice young 23-year-old boy. And he was wandering around one day and he walked past a car yard and saw a very nice shiny black Nissan. Uh, he decided to buy that car and was upgraded into a very nice options package and basically literally drove out of that car after signing a dealer finance package at 15%. Going rate, about 9% if you chopped around for four and a quarter seconds. Financial literacy. So why are we working so hard in the schools? Because for Daniel, buying a car has many parts of financial literacy. It's not just, even if he'd shopped around for the right car, which he didn't. It's actually all about, first of all, it's, we know this stuff, okay? We're a bit smug about it. Obviously, you do a budget, determine your cash flow. Then you, then you look at what car you want. You shop around for the cheapest price for that vehicle. If you are financing, you shop around for cheap finance. And one of the big things we get, for example, in military, in our Australian military, um, Army, Air Force and Navy, where we're enforcing financial literacy. And it's one of the few places we can force adults to learn and test them. And if we fail, we make them come back again. And one of the reasons for that is that when they come back from, for example, Timor or Iraq, with great relief they get back to Australia with their earned danger money and genuinely earned danger money. And quite often they buy a big, red, large vehicle. And quite often they don't insure it. They then prank it. And then they've got a debt and no car. So even buying a motor vehicle has four steps of financial literacy, which we know about and we do intuitively. Now, it, it's in a sense, I'll pick on myself. It's easy for me to be, well, gee, I don't have credit card problems. And, you know, gee, I've always spent less than I've earned. But the system taught me that. The reality is when I went to university, I'm a country kid, my dad was a, a doctor in Griffith in New South Wales, about the only legal drug, drug dealer for about 200 miles, by the way. But um, um, and I came to, to University of New South Wales as an 18-year-old country kid. And in 1974, my mum and dad, uh, we sat down and we worked out an allowance. It was enough to cover my university college fees and a little bit. And so I got a job in the Regent Hotel in Anzac Parade near New South Wales, serving beers. And I used to work Thursday and Saturday nights to get a bit of spending money. Now, basically, the reality was that if I didn't get to the bank by four o'clock on Friday, how much money did I have on the weekend? None. <laughs> now, young people, now I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, okay? Uh, but your kids, or no, there's a few youngsters hanging around. But basically, the major innovation in my life at university was banks used to close at three o'clock on Friday, and then they started closing, you may recall, at four o'clock on Friday giving me an extra 60 minutes to get my $20 out for the weekend. And I quickly learnt about financial literacy, because university colleges have always been inclined to have a few beers, and I rather support this concept. Uh, but if I got $20 out, um, and I ran out of money at 10 o'clock on Saturday night, what did I do? Went home. <laughs> because my mates were as broke as I was, as yours were. ATMs, and my children cannot, my, my children are convinced, my children are in their 20s, they're convinced that ATMs were invented in the 1830s. <laughs> and my kids will say, but for heaven's sake, Dad, you could have used your credit card. I mean, bank card was only the first widely used consumer credit card, 1980. Yeah, I was already, well, I was through, I was through five years of uni by then, I would have been in my sixth year when a credit card turned up. And I love it when young financial review journalists who are really smart kids and they go, oh, OK, Paul, all right, so, all right, so what you're saying is even if you wanted to be stupid with money, you couldn't, which is true. I couldn't be stupid, OK? And so I was protected from my own stupidity. And the journalists, young journalists, oh, come on, Paul, you must have had a mobile phone bill problem. <laughs> See, you're old enough, OK? I do this with uni students, they don't understand what I'm talking about because they think mobile phones were invented in 1830 as well as ATMs and credit cards. Isn't it amazing how the world changes so quickly? 
So basically, why are we here tonight to debate and discuss, as a society, do we educate ourselves and young Australians about the money and the risks of money, investment risk, getting ripped off, scams, disasters, fiascos? Or, as a society, do we protect you, and here I put my government hat on, do we protect you by regulating? Do we ensure you cannot be ripped off? Quite challenging. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, let's just talk about that for a few moments. I hope I've established the case, and a primary case, that why, in a sense, should our system not have put an effort into regulating and educating me about money, bluntly I will argue I did not need it. I could not spend more than I earned. So in my case, if I ran out of money, which happened regularly, because uh, I didn't mind beer, and still don't, uh, so what we do is we used to go to the, uh, the Randwick, um, you know, the, the, the free paper that arrives in your news box. And back in those days you got $9 per thousand delivering them. And if we got really stuck, we'd duck up to the local newspaper in Randwick and we'd go out at four in the morning on Saturday and we'd deliver a thousand newspapers. And back in those days, by the way, 1974 was a wonderful time. A schooner of beer in a public bar was 33 cents. Here's financial literacy for you. So with a dollar, you could buy three schooners of beer and you'd grab the cent in the hope of saving 33 more of them so you could buy another beer. And that's really pragmatic. And did anyone leave a cent on the bar back in those days? Because 33 of them would buy a beer, OK? So I am putting forth the argument, they're trying to make it a bit light-hearted, that the system did not, did the schooling system, Macquarie University, the government did not really need to teach me a lot. I started work as a young analyst. And basically, all of a sudden, I went from 33 bucks a week pulling beers. I think I started on um, about $13,500. Had more money than I could imagine. I mean, I owned a push bike. I had a $33 a week spending habit. If all of a sudden you start getting $260, it's like a miracle. My wallet was stuffed full of money until I bought a car. Um, things happened. Got married. Got a house. Children. All of a sudden, the wallet was not terribly stuffed at all. Now, so basically, even though it was apart from borrowing money to buy a house, it was really hard for me to get in trouble. Let's now turn to January of 1980, 1990, my apologies. I'm now Vicky and myself, my, my wife, we've now got uh, two young kiddies and we're contemplating a third. And that for us was probably our biggest ever financial crisis. And no, we didn't make any bad investment. We didn't get ripped off. Our mortgage became 18.75%. Anyone remember that one? It wasn't that fun. I don't know about you, that for me was worse than the global financial crisis. In the global financial crisis, my shares and stuff went down in value and some went broke, but they bounced back up again and the income remained relatively the same. So, you know, I wasn't particularly stressed about it, but for me, that and Vicky, that was a real crisis. Uh, so basically all sorts of things happened to all of us and they're not really things you can regulate against, but why did you survive in January of 1990 with an 18.75% mortgage? And I'm, I, Vicky and myself survived, even though it wasn't easy. I suspect we survived because we didn't have 20 or 30 grand in credit card debt and two cars with personal loans and furniture we'd got from Jerry Harvey on a consumer finance contract. So the world has changed. I am not for one second arguing we go back to the previous world. I cannot tell you how cranky my wife Vicky was uh, when, uh, as a young, she was a school teacher. Uh, and I was starting work, obviously, as a young analyst. We went to National Australia Bank, very proud. We'd saved up a bit of a deposit and we wanted to buy a home. Um, youngsters, $90,000 in those days for a semi in our time. Um, but inflation makes a difference to this today. But we at the National Australia Bank and the bank manager, we got an appointment and we said to the manager, you know, we've saved a bit of a deposit, not a lot, but a bit of a deposit. And, you know, I've got a bit of income and Vicky's a school teacher. And the bank manager said, right, he said, you're a young married couple. He said, um, basically, the bank will not be lending you any money. You will get pregnant any minute now. Buzz off. Now, I, you know, it's not really very helpful, is it? Now, luckily, building societies had just started in those days. And St George Building Society said, oh, for heaven's sake, you've got a bit of a deposit. You've both got a job. And for heaven's sake, maternity leave. And for heaven's sake, you know, here's a bit of money to help you buy your $90,000 semi in our time. And I think for everyone, it was a pretty good deal. We paid the money back. and. Everyone was happy, blah, blah, blah. So I'm arguing that, that in a sense, this debate is not so much we're dumber with money, we are not, we are far smarter. You young folk here tonight, you're much smarter than we were. But the world is incredibly complicated. The other overriding factor, in my opinion, as to why this is such a crucial issue globally, is that 
allow me to be a little blunt here, is that when I finished university in the late 1970s, and I first started as a young analyst, and the fact of the matter is, and this is a narrow statistical piece of information, so treat it for what it is, but basically what we knew back then was that a 65-year-old male retiring in the mid to late 1970s after a, a long executive, now we are very narrow here, actually don't, don't try and expand this theory out, uh, we're talking about e executive career, they've done their decades with Westpac or whatever, in, nine, in the late 1970s, anyone care to guess how long the typical 65-year-old male lasted for in retirement? Yeah, 2.4 years. Yeah, about 2.4. And the widow lived much longer, by the way. And, and, and sorry. Don't live much more. No, well, two point. No, you don't. No, look, 2.4. Even I could survive 2.4 years. Okay. Um, now, again, let me ask you another question. You're very knowledgeable. You're all alumni of this university and so on. We're having a here to have a. You know, I'm very happy to have a bit of conversation. And you feel free to disagree with me, by the way. I'm no problem at all. 1908. In I think a really important move. Uh, our government, our forebears, established the first age pension system in Australia. I'm going to pick on males for a minute, if I may. In 1908, our forebears chose a male pension age of 65. At what age did males, and obviously this male has been born in the you know, middle of the 1800s or something, in 1908, what age did the average male die? 64? <laughs> Not bad. 54. 54 in 1908. Our forebears chose a pension age 11 years after the average age of death. <laughs> How much pressure do you think retirement pensions put on the government of the day? Next to nickel. The pension, by the way, was 13% of average weekly earnings. You needed to pay tax for 25 years and you needed a magistrate certificate to say that you had made a, a valuable contribution to society and then lived 11 years past when you meant to die. Now, Leonie Tickle, um, here at this university, uh, she's working with me in my role as Chair of Financial Literacy, uh, as many of the professors here are, and researchers and students and so on. We're all really excited about this initiative and I congratulate Macquarie University on being a leader in this field. So now we come to stage two of this debate. But we, I'm simply setting the scene, OK? Why is this important? If it's not important, it doesn't matter if we regulate or educate. The whole debate's irrelevant. We've got to establish a base case. I'm trying to establish the world is more complicated, and I'm secondly trying to establish that money is far more important because of life extension. So, we move forwards. It's quite astonishing. And we all know the basic facts. If we go back, we've got demographics for millennium. If we go back to the earliest recorded time of, of demographics, we all know in Egyptian sort of times, the average age of death was about, again, uh, females are typically three to four years longer, by the way, and have been for many. That's narrowing, which is interesting. Uh, but basically, back then, about 34 years old, we carked it. So you worked and you died. Now, what's really interesting is that 1908, and if you feel free again, one of the great joys of stuff like Google is, in the, you know, I can't really tell you stuff that, you know, you just check it when you get home. Yeah, the Bureau of Stats has got it all there, okay? This is very easy for you to check on me. Very, and feel free to do so. So basically, if it was 54 in 1908, basically what has happened in that time is we've seen the most remarkable increase in life extension ever in human history. And in a moment of true genius, we invent a word which didn't exist until the late 1800s called retirement. That word never existed before then. And the reason was you basically worked and you died. Around about 3% of the world never really worked, as in the really, really rich people, and the rest of us kind of worked and died, and if we got crook, we hoped like hell we had enough kids to care for us. And, you know, that really was about it. I don't know what your feelings are on your... I think, well, one of those days, was it the eldest daughter, who, oldest daughter who gave up a career to care for you in your dotage? Yeah, my eldest daughter's a lawyer. I just don't quite see it, you know? Like, she might hire someone to look after me. <laughs> I'm probably like you. I don't really want her to care for me in my dotage. To be, I don't really want to do, do you, I don't really want to do that to her. She's a nice kid. Maybe she will. Uh, anyway, we'll leave that one alone for a moment. We'll come to that. That's another issue. That's another completely different issue. Um, so, for me, we know how negative the media is at the moment, it's just unrelenting negativity. The end of the resources boom. 
the bubble, inverted commas, which is nonsense, by the way, in bank shares. Uh, will housing prices collapse 40 per cent and bring the... Yeah, oh, for heaven's sake. Um, look, the end of the... Look, I'm not, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, but the, the end of the resources boom is where, as you're aware, 1.3 billion of our friends living in China, and I say friends very deliberately, I, I think it just it's, we are part of the Asian nation. That's why, you know, wandering around this wonderful university, just seeing, you know, so many kids of different cultures is just wonderful. It's just such, such a pleasure. And so, you know, we can't be this little insular place, and I'm glad we're trying not to be. Uh, but, you know, the end of the resources boom. So we're, we're, currently, we're currently terrified that China may only grow at 7% per annum. Now, oh, dearie, dearie me. Oh, dearie, 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 dearie. Only 7%. Goodness me, what a terrible thing that would be. Uh, as you know, in China this year, they're building, I think it's 17 airports, three times the size of Sydney Airport, each of them. They're building half a dozen cities bigger than Sydney this year. Anyone think that might need a bit of energy? A bit of energy, possibly? So, obviously, iron ore is going to go up and down. I mean, we were flogging iron ore 15 years ago for 40 bucks a tonne. All of a sudden, it becomes 180 bucks. Isn't that wonderful? Now it's fallen down again. BHP and Rio can still dig the stuff and deliver it into Asia at 50 bucks a tonne, but we get used to things, don't we? Uh, again, we get scammed all the time. The, uh, the, last, the, the, you know, the last budget, and I need to be a little careful here because um, I do work with, um, obviously, uh, I'm non-political. Uh, it's my pro bono time. I donate it. But I, I do work with, with Wayne Swan's office, obviously, and Treasury in particular. So I need to be a, a little cautious, but I am allowed. I'm not looking for votes, by the way. Uh, I am allowed to, to speak out. And did you, did you see the nonsense in the last budget about government revenue collapsing? I think Wayne Swan was saying revenues being, was it, smashed with a sledgehammer. Do you realise what those words, how many of us, I hope many of you as alumni of this university did look behind those words. What he got away with, I'm not quite sure how he got away with this, is the Treasury, which the government accepted, projected our revenue as a nation would grow by 13%. 13% increase in tax take. In actual fact, tax last year, and I'm rounding these numbers out by 0.1 of a percent. Last year, our tax take grew by 7%, giving us the greatest amount of government revenue in the history of this country. But it was only 7. The government had already planned to spend 13. So revenue didn't get smashed. Revenue grew dramatically. It just didn't grow as much as they'd spent. That's a financial literacy issue. For you people as business people, many of you in this room will run your own all sorts of areas. If I said to you, look, I'm, I'm an economicsy type, and I reckon you're going to get 13% more revenue next year in your business, and you'd go, yeah, 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 yeah. Believe it when I see it, would you not? And if you started to see it, you might start to spend it. How many of you, on the basis of a nitwit like me, how many of you would start spending 13% more on my projection without you seeing it come in? That's what happened. Government revenue is bloody fantastic. Where's our problem? It's a financial literacy problem, isn't it? We're earning plenty of tax. We're spending too much. That's a challenging one. You all know you can't run your budget like that, can you? And nor can Vicky and myself, so quite interesting. So that's a bit of education, maybe. So here we go. So I am arguing because of complexity. If I am going to retire, I'm 58 this year. If I'm going to retire at 60, I'm curious about how long I might live. I don't know. I can go online. I like the death clock. The death clock's quite good. It's got two versions, long or short. The long version, you need a recent blood test. You've got to put in enzymes and cholesterol and HDL and LDL, aunts, uncles, mothers, brothers, sisters. I mean, you, and then the bit, on, the bit I love is you put in your weight, it instantly says you're lying, and it's, all, and it's always correct. In particular, the short version of death clock needs your BMI, your body mass index. And it's incredibly sensitive to whether you're, I must admit I am a few kilos overweight at the moment, and I'm creeping a little bit close in the normal range. I'm getting horribly close to going from that, that, you know, that tiny little thing from normal to overweight, and I've got to admit I'm on the barrier. So I had to cheat a kilo to get my weight into, because the, you know, if you, if you, you know. So anyway, you fill that out, and it came up and said I would die on September the 21st. Um, anyway, it's going to be 91. Now, uh, Vicky, who actually is healthier than me, and I could actually tick the broccoli box. Uh, in my case, I had to tick the pizza box. Uh, Vicky's going to be 103, according to this death clock. And um, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And um, it's just stunning. It, it's just stunning. Um, 
And uh, you think, is that a fib? And this is where people like Leonie Tickle at this university are really interested, because they're the demographers who do the hard-nosed research. And the only thing that Leonie can show me, well, not the only, my apologies, one of the most interesting things she can show me, a paper she's written on the subject and published shortly, and we're talking more about it at Macquarie University, is that every single prediction of age has been laughed at. So life extension has been laughed at throughout human history, and it's always been wrong because it's been underestimated. So is Dr. Carl Krasnowski on ABC? Is Dr. Carl right when he says that my generation may be the last generation who does not have to choose when to die? Not much argument from the medical faculty here at Macquarie University and everyone else that 50% of females today will live to 100. Not much argument. Not much argument that the first Australians to be 150 are wandering around. And if Leonie Tickle's research here at the university is correct, we'll probably get that wrong on the low side. So death clock says to me, Paul, you'll cark it at 91 on average. And let's be aware of what an average is. The average Australian family has 2.2 children. How many have you seen? Average Australian family has 13% of a Labrador. How many have you seen? Average Australian will die at? The reality is I'll either die earlier or later, OK? It is, I might, no, for all I know, I could cark it on the way home. Um, you know, I'm going to a funeral tomorrow with one of my mates my age. Not good. Life is not fair. Crap happens, OK? These are just averages. But if we take the average, I'm arguing that financial literacy and money becomes fundamentally important. We've already, and you can check me up, uh, but in the 1970s, if as a male I was going to live 2.4 years in retirement, I agree with you, sir. Money's not a pressing issue in my life. It really isn't. The other big issue is that if I retired in the 1970s and I lived a long life, what was my spending plan looking like? What was the primary nominated retirement activity in the 1960s, 50s, 70s? What was the thing we did most of in retirement? Gardening. If you are a gardener, I am so happy for you, it's cheap. <laughs> Vicky and myself love the garden. We could watch the gardener all day. <laughs> in the 1970s, people used to learn a language at TAFE. People used to go to a cooking class at TAFE. This year, Australians, and by the way, the World Bank's recent survey says we are the most miserable adults on the planet. In fact, the Greeks are now happier than us. I wish I was joking. The research says the Greeks reckon it can't get any worse. We're frightened it might. No, and that's actually not a joke, sadly. Uh, we, uh, we notice, and you say, look, I'm not going to do it to you now, but on the way out, say to the person next to you, you know, how's things going? And, you, you know, oh, business is terrible, you know, the share market hasn't recovered fully yet, you know, it, it's a whinge a thon, led by the media and done brilliantly by our politicians, who I must say are doing a magnificent job at negativity, are they not? Uh, just a stroke of genius there. But we truly are miserable at the moment and proven by, by global surveys. It's just, it's just fascinating stuff. So, my argument is financial literacy is really important because we are living longer, we are living more expensively, our expectations are significantly higher, and money is just bloody complicated. It really is, uh, particularly in this global market. So, I need to be out of here in, in, uh, in uh, the next, uh, fifth, I'm determined to finish on time. So do we regulate or do we educate? You're intelligent people and the problem I've got here is the people who come to talks like this, particularly if money is mentioned, I know by definition you're actually good with money. The people who aren't here should be. You should be at home. <laughs> What's well, true, isn't it? It's the way it is. You're good at money. Uh, and you'll have had bad things happen to you. Um, I mean, I'd, for example, one of my crackerjack investments was in a moment a true genius with five uni mates. I bought a property at Mount Beauty in, uh, in uh, Victoria. And we paid... Um, I think we chipped in not a lot of money each. And whatever we paid for it back in the 1980s, we paid for it. And after, I've, I've actually, it's actually difficult to lose 100% of your investment in property when you pay cash. We managed it. Genius. What we didn't realise is we thought Mount Beauty, feeders to Falls Creek, skiing's going to grow, demographics, Australian population's growing, Mount Beauty's going to boom. 
What we forgot about is this generation isn't about to travel 45 minutes to go skiing. So apartments at Falls Creek went gangbusters because we are the convenience generation. Mount Beauty went dog-like. And so after a decade and a half of paying rates and uh, clipping the Blackberry, we actually managed to sell the property, and 100% uh, is a bit of an exaggeration. We actually only lost 60% on the purchase price over 15 years. We sold it for 40% of what we paid for it. But after our brambles and rates, we actually managed to lose more than 100% on the property investment we bought for cash. Now there's genius. Now who can I sue for that? Who's going to regulate me for my own stupidity there? Interesting. So this is a difficult subject matter. Let me make regulation simple for you. We fought very hard and long um, in the world of consumer credit and financial literacy for simple stuff where regulation is clearly works beautifully. Uh, for example, I think one of the best examples we had, I got to spring uh, the, prof the good professor, Mark. Where are you, good professor? Where'd he go? He's around oh, here. He's the good professor. Very intelligent man, uh, head of the department in, in, in the area that I do some work. A very clever guy sprung him using the ATM downstairs to take some money out and it wasn't his ATM so he had to pay a two dollar fee. Now this is a good piece of regulation because what has happened is around about two thirds of Australians have changed their behaviour after the banks were required to do two things. Number one, you knew you were paying a fee but up on the screen comes this is going to cost you two bucks or if you're in a pub it might be three bucks. And the other important behavioural part of the regulation is you've got to press a button to donate two bucks to the bank. I will bet you, every, me, every one of you has changed behaviour slightly. Good piece of regulation. Very simple. But what do we do about the billions of dollars that investors have lost? Let me just read something. When I started this industry 30 years ago as a young analyst, um, some of this stuff. Remember a state mortgage, anyone? Half a billion dollars of retirees' money down the spout. Pyramid Building Society collapsed. FinCorp, West Point. A really telling moment for me was when I was filming the Money Show. I was up on the Gold Coast. I had a thousand. I had well, I actually had five thousand retirees wanted to come to a meeting. We could only seat a thousand. They had all invested with a couple of smaller Gold Coast law firms in a solicitor's mortgage. And those mortgages were promising a higher return on your money and they were called a solicitor's mortgage with first mortgage security, no more than two-thirds loan to valuation ratio, paying you a much better return. Feels good. You'll still see them in the papers today, by the way, usually offering 9 or 10%. We know people are going to flock into these investments, which is why we run financial literacy out of ASIC. You'll have seen one of my board members, Greg Metcraft, is chairman of ASIC, warning only last week, with low-term deposits, we need to be aware as a society that retirees, it's all very damn good and well that people with a mortgage are doing it better. How's it for you when the term deposit rate goes from 8% down to 4%? There are never all winners. When my mortgage was 18.75%, my dad rang me up in a state of joy. <laughs> he just got a 16% term deposit. We forget one side against the other side. We're a bit debt obsessed at the moment. What about independent retirees? So we know that as term deposit rates have gone from 8% five years ago to around about 4 and a bit percent today, will independent retirees have worked hard to put money aside, will they be seeking a higher return? Absolutely. It's how you eat. Particularly if you're going to live 30 or 40 years. It's how you eat. So what are you going to do? Well, we know and uh, this is where it's made the front page of most newspapers, we know that independent retirees are going to be looking towards higher, safe investments. So one of the things we're working very hard to do is to ensure that people have to disclose risk correctly. So for example, uh, what a state mortgage, what pyramid, and we, this has been going on for 30 billions of dollars of investors' money, and not just losing half your money, which you know, the market's made, we're losing a lot, basically. And so what they're doing is they're, they're basically offering and at the moment, if someone is saying to you, as Estate Mortgage did, as Pyramid did, as West Point did, as Banksia did and so on, I can give you 8% on your money today with security. Well, how come the bank can only give me 4%? Oh, we're much cleverer than the bank. You know, our margins are less or something. So basically, what you need to come up with, well, but if I'm investing in one of your mortgages and you're paying me 8%, the person you're lending it to, you're a business, you want to make a profit, 
we know it probably costs about 3% to run a money sort of business like that. So if you're paying me eight, you've got to be lending at 11. And they go, prefer not to talk about that. Because who do you think is borrowing at 11 when you can borrow from the bank at six? Poor quality risk. Yet we know, for, you won't do this, the reason you're here today is you know a lot about money. But out there in the bigger world, we actually see focus groups all the time with perfectly intelligent people who go, here's this property investment offering you first mortgage security with a valuation, you're only, you're only lending your money to two thirds of the value of the property, and you're going to get eight here or 4% return deposit, which sounds better. I'd rather eight, thank you very much. And the trouble is, is here I think regulation is probably really helpful. Um, I've been, uh, been, my idea was banned. Uh, I wanted to insist, these companies do need a prospectus now. I actually was wanted to insist that on the front cover you had a picture of a pensioner couple sitting on their furniture in the street. Um, that was lobbied again rather intensely. Um, but it would have got the point across. It would have made people more care. I'm not saying you can't get higher returns. I, I am really, really happy if someone says, I can get you a higher return on your money and you will be taking a higher risk. I am really unhappy if it's you can get a higher return for no more risk. Now, you all know that's got to be crap. Sorry about to say crap. That was terrible. You all know that would be nonsense. But, you know, most people don't. So, But how do we regulate risk? And this is a really a challenging issue. I mean, how did someone protect me from my dud Mount Beauty investment? Well, I don't think they should have done. But that's a bit different to me in retirement, isn't it? particularly if I'm facing decades in retirement. Well, no, don't get facing negative, by the way. This ageing thing's fantastic, OK? This is really cool. For me, the only solution I can see is work longer. I hope, like, heck, my health holds out. I mean, I, you know, unlike my mate tomorrow's funeral I'm going to, well, I guess, well, I guess he doesn't have any financial problems at all. But that's not the option I'm looking for. So what the debate we're having at the moment is what is good regulation? And a bit like the debate into unnecessary deaths in hospitals and so on, we all know full well the media grabs on this thing, but the simple reality is how many people tell me about a great experience in a hospital system? A lot. How many people tell me about a great experience with money and so on? A lot. How many people tell me about a great experience with a lawyer, an accountant? A lot. But gee, the bad stuff's painful. So the one thing I think we're doing quite well at the moment, it, well, no, it's not good enough. Um, but certainly the FOFA, the new regulations requiring transparency around investment advisors, and in particular, the thing that I'm keenest on is really rigorous legal enforcement of a very special world, which is in the client's best interest. This all starts in July, and it's causing advisors no end of trauma, which cheers me up no end, because in a sense, if you like, it's going to force advisors to only charge fees. Now, by the way, guess what out there in the real world? People actually don't like fees. Free advice sounds better, but it's got to cost you something. And so one of the problems and why the industry is going to have to change dramatically or really serious consequences, this is serious legislation which has taken a long time to come, but basically, in a sense, the, the regulation of in your client's best interest is rather better than 5,000 pages defining every single investment. You can't legislate against people taking risk. How did you make your money? Did you borrow money to buy a house one day? It probably worked very well for you. Did you borrow some money to run a business, an overdraft? What did you do? So these things, I think, you know, I think risk is appropriate, but it's it's transparency around risk. So it's advisors being required to ex their fees in writing, their conflict of interest in writing. Well, I'm conflicted. We all are. I, you know, I, I, but I, you know, at the end of the day, we have many hats on. And so basically, it is this fundamental understanding for me. So I think regulation, I think we can do a lot better around the simple stuff. Like the bank, two bucks is going to cost you. Regulate the damn thing. Insider trading. I think, you can, you know, I think we're doing, we haven't put enough people in jail, by the way, but it's better. Now, property is kind of exempt from the law. I had a question at a seminar recently, please don't do this to me, uh, where I'll be finishing in about uh, five minutes, by the way, where someone said, um, I said, oh, you know, I was talking about risk and return. I said, oh, no, 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 Paul, you're completely wrong. You know, I've consistently bought property, made 20, 30 percent per annum, all of them, you know, years and years and years, you know, your stuff's and no risk at all. And I said, how on earth are you doing that? And he said, oh, my brother's on Liverpool Council. Um, I did, <laughs> um, 
Now, we, I mean, oh, we, we shouldn't mention Eddie O'Beard, should we? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's clearly good. But, well, it's a great way to get rich, isn't it? I mean, if ever say, you know, might not sleep at night. Um, but it is a great way. Uh, and, you know, this person wasn't joking, by the way. They were buying properties about to be rezoned. And uh, simply the knowledge they had was rezoning about to happen. Now, let, let's, let's put aside the silly... The, well, it's, no, it wasn't silly. It's true, sadly. And we all know it goes on. Um, but the property market, you know, and I am really frightened at the moment, is as, and I think interest rates will go lower, by the way, and I am really frightened that the next generation, because for mine, you know, if someone has a, a, a retirees, and we know what's going to happen, don't we? Pre the global financial crisis, people own shares, I own shares, you own shares, super, whatever it may be. The reality is we all got a bit excited. Look, I must admit, I, I bought a few shares in um, one of the investment banks that went broke. Um, Babcock and Brown, as my broker flogged me some, and uh, you know, and, uh, luckily it wasn't a lot of my portfolio. I wasn't terribly happy when they went broke. By the way, I was a bit ticked off actually. But I actually thought it was my responsibility. Um, you know, maybe I could have killed him. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but look, these things happen. But the thing that you know, I, I do think where you can't regulate and where education is really good. And if I can give you a simple example as a finishing point, um, and I'll try and just very quickly wrap this up into a sensible, coherent thought. But I had a call on radio um, during the crisis. You might recall, let, let's pick on a stock, any stock. This is a retiree. And they happen to own in their portfolio Commonwealth Bank shares and amongst other stuff. And let's use the Commonwealth Bank shares as an example. They rang me on Tony Delroy and ABC and said, look, you know, we're just sick of this. Um, Commonwealth Bank was 54 bucks. It's that day he rang, it was down to $25. I've lost, I've lost, I've lost half my money. I said, what'd you pay for him? And he said, oh, six bucks. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, well, why have you lost half your money? Like six bucks to 25, five bucks, what? No, 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 they were 54. I'm losing money, I can't sleep at night. No, but cool. if you can't sleep at night, you should, okay, I hear what you're saying. What are you worried about? He said, these Commonwealth Bank shares, and he had a, a shares in many banks. He said, I'm gonna sell them, and I'm gonna put the money in Commonwealth Bank term deposits. And I said, so you're not worried about the bank going broke? He said, no, I'm not worried about them getting around. And I said, well, but why are you switching and he said, oh, it's the volatility. And I said, okay, well, back, back, back. Are you spending your capital or your income? He said, no, no, I'm retired, you fool. Literally called me a fool, which is, oh, oh God. Well, people call me all sorts of things you get used to. You stick your head up, you're going to get people kicking you, it's life. And, um, and, I, and I said, well, now, hang on, look, I, may be, I accept I, I'm a fool, that's fine. But you're not spending capital, you're spending income. He said, yes. I said, what's happened to your dividend stream from things like your bank shares and Woolworths? Nothing. So why are you going to buy a high-risk investment for you called a term deposit? And he said, you're mad. If I buy a term deposit, I'm getting my money back, aren't I? I said, yes, you are. But that's not the bit you need. You need the income stream. A term deposit's one of the risky investments I know in terms of your income stream. And he went, huh, huh, never thought about that. And I said, and by the way, with well, the Commonwealth Bank, that day it was about $24.60. I said, it's yielding 13% fully frank dividend and the Australian government's just guaranteed all deposits up to a million dollars. And he went, oh yeah, maybe I should buy some more. I said, no, 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 we're going from one ridiculous extreme to the other. But you know, but you know, isn't it funny when I say to you, and how, how do we regulate that? A term deposit is one of the riskiest investments I know for income. It's one of the safest investments I know for the security of your capital. A share is one of the risky investments I know for your capital and probably one of the most reliable for income, depending on which share you choose. For example, if you go back to Woolworths, the day of the float, look, look, look me back on the money program. The day Woolworths floated, I was jumping up and down. And back in those days, without the internet and stuff, the money program was watched by nearly 5 million people around the country. And I was jumping up and down saying, look, I really think you should be buying Woolworths at $2.45 because my fundamental view is people will keep eating. Okay, it's a really detailed, analytical piece of you know, intellectual research. And, um, and I said, and the dividend in the first year, feel free to check up on me, was about 12 cents. Since then, the Woolworths share price has gone up, it's gone down, it's close to 30 bucks now, don't care. What's the dividend this year? About $1.20. So if I'm living in retirement, it's a challenge for me because the investment I intuitively feel closest to is the safest, a term deposit, where my capital is safe. But possibly my income, no, not possibly. Would we not all agree my income is the renewal rate I'll get in X years? It is highly unsafe. 
Like many Australians at the peak of the crisis, I took an 8% Westpac five-year term deposit in my super fund. Because I was, I'm all for spreading risk, by the way. I, I, I don't know either. But about the only intelligent question you can ask a money person is why are you still working? <laughs> That's about it. Because we don't have any miracles. So basically, my Westpac 8% term deposit for five years is coming back up again. What rate am I being offered? 4.1. <laughs> my income's halved. It's, it's challenging, isn't it? How do we regulate that? So what I'm going to conclude with is that I think regulate or educate is an incredibly important issue because the simple truth is that particularly the people who can least afford to lose money have lost money. Unfortunately, we know for a fact regulation was not good enough. I understand, yes, we've set up complaint schemes and all sorts of stuff, but as soon as the insurers get involved, look, it's a better world, but it's a highly imperfect world. Uh, I think education is your, and you don't need to be Albert Einstein, by the way. This is not, you don't need to understand options trading, futures trading, or underlying contracts. For me, it's, gee, probably the bank term deposit rate is probably a close enough to a risk free rate of return. So for me at the moment, a risk free rate of return, I do think a bank term deposit is fairly, not fairly risk free for my capital, okay? And if I'm putting another quarter million dollars, I've got an Australian federal government guarantee. Pretty risk free. If anything is higher than 4%, would we all agree it has to be riskier? So if anyone tells us it is more than 4% with the same risk as a term deposit, I think we should get really frightened. But I can't put people off risk. I'd love to protect everyone. I'd like to protect me from risk, but I cannot. Because what risk are we talking about? If I buy a 4% term deposit today, it might be 2.5% in three years' time. If I put all my money in Woolworths, hoping people will keep eating, I'm probably right. But for all, I, I suspect the dividend from Woolworths will be secure. Well, not that, wrong word. Will be relatively consistent in a few years' time, but the share price might be half for all I know. And that's the challenge of regulation. So I think we can regulate in the sense of enforcing transparency, enforcing know your client rules, in, try to enforce consumer protection as well as we can. But the reason 100 countries around the world and are now investing time in regulation and education. So I am concluding the debate is not regulate or educate. I think in some areas regulation works better. Try and put crooks in jail. I, I, I'm, I'm with it. But at the end of the day, I don't think anyone cares more about your money than you do. And I think one of the great investments in our community, which is why we are now in, sh in, in locked in, we've been bust busting our butts for a decade to get this in. We're now teaching kids, maybe your grandkids, money skills, not right around the country yet. We're getting there gradually. We've trained some 9,000 teachers. We've got 92 money smart schools and we're getting there. Money skills are built into the curriculum in English and maths and science. Why English? Because my industry, as you know, has developed a whole new language of its own. Salary sacrifice. You all go, yes, salary sacrifice. I only pay 15% tax, I'm a winner. Average Australian goes, salary sacrifice. That's when the boss says there's no more overtime. The language is, is, is impenetrable. So we've got a whole bunch of challenges in front of us. Why Macquarie University? Mark, how many kids have you got doing financial literacy in first year now? Over a thousand kids. And they, they, you don't force them to do that, do you? They choose. So that's really interesting. Mobile phone contracts are complicated. So rather than teaching our kids law based on an 18th century English property acquisition, which is how I learnt contracts, we're getting the kids to chuff off and get their mobile phone contract. And their homework is, how can you choose a contract that will save you money? Kids find that far more inspiring than an English 18th century factory. So basically there's all sorts of stuff we can do there. And so we are proceeding strongly and I cannot, I'm not sitting on the fence here, in some cases, regulation works better. At the end of the day, things will go wrong, as they will go wrong in medicine, they will go wrong in accounting. You've seen some of the legal cases that have gone badly wrong, disputes over fees. The world is not going to be perfect. The funeral I'm going to tomorrow, I do not believe, it's always the good ones who die. I don't believe my mate deserved to die. But it's basically, it's the way it is. So bad stuff's going to happen. I am going to make bad investments in the future, I'm going to make good investments. The only plan I have is to try and spread my risk as much as I can. I like simple things. I like to buy a bit of property. 
The Australian population, I am advised by Treasury, the median point will be 35 million people in the next 27 years. I reckon they'll live somewhere. We have an undersupply of housing at the moment. I reckon if I own a bit of property over the next 30 years of my life, I reckon it'll do okay. Some years it'll fall in value, some years it'll go up in value. I think the rental stream will be okay. I like to own a few shares because I believe over time the Woolworths, the banks, the pharmaceutical companies, I mean, think about where's growing demand. Take companies like Sonic, for example. Look at some of the effort Macquarie University's put into the health area. What does Sonic do? Own Hanley Moy. I think Hanley Moy are on site here, aren't they? And Sonic's nearby. Uh, blood testing. Are you finding your doctors drawing more and more blood out of you each year? <laughs> I lost a litre the other day. God. <laughs> Vitamin D. and then They're going to find cancer markers in blood before long, right? I want to own companies that are doing that stuff in my client in my push air portfolio. I want to own that stuff. It's not being clever. So far, I, I, the ageing population, aged care is really interesting. I want to own businesses doing that stuff. I think it's going to be important. I'm not trying to get rich quick here. I don't think I will. That's why I still work. But I actually think that by having money going at a sensible, and I'll have a few punty shares as well. You know, some will go wrong, some will go right, but I'll spread my risk. But for me, it's a lot about common sense. So I'm going to argue strongly that regulation is the right answer in a bunch of probably simpler things. The big issue is risk, and I'm not sure we can effectively regulate risk. I really don't think we can ban you from starting a business or borrowing money to buy a house. Where do you draw the line? So for me, the solution is regulation where we get grunt from our regulation we enforce stuff, try and put people in jail if we can, or get them out of the industry, whatever it may be. But for me, the ultimate solution is maybe it's a little bit like uh, James Keane here is a lifesaver with the Macquarie Uni at, uh, at, uh, at uh, um, Queenscliff. And you know, I, I rather think the analogy of on a beach, what we try and do is we try and say, look, from a regulation viewpoint, we kind of say, here's the flags. We're not promising you're not going to die if you swim between the flags but you're safer there than you are outside the flags. I think what we need to do with regulation is to promise you you are safe is wrong. You need to be wary, you know that. But I do think we can plant, for me the flags are too far apart at the moment, okay? There's too many places you can drown without people seeing you. So my view about regulation is, on this big beach, let's try and get the flags in a somewhat, let's try and get rid of the absolute rogues. Now what we do about 60 minutes on Sunday night with the latest Nigerian scam with black money, can't regulate it. It's done on the internet, it's done when you're overseas. It, you got, I've got to try and, you know, can't regulate that stuff. Crooks are crooks. But if we, in Australia in particular, I do think we can get the, the flags a bit closer together and we need to bring property inside the flags. Most Australians will not lose money out of shares falling in value or bad advice. Property will tend to be the biggest scam because we feel safest. Remember the radio ads? Fly to Queensland, buy a property for 20 bucks a week, going to make a fortune? Yeah, the only problem was they were selling the property for twice what they were worth. People used to ring me up and say, how can they afford the free flight? I'd say, well, you pay me $400,000 for a $200,000 property, I'll fly you anywhere you like. <laughs> Terrific scam. So it's where we feel comfortable with both at risk. And so for me, bringing property inside the flag is important. So for me, Last point. Regulation. Can't leave everyone out there on their own. Things are going to go wrong. Try and narrow the flags to a reasonable level, but even when you're swimming inside the flags, I'm going to keep repeating that I think even inside the flags, education remains fundamental. I need to know, if I'm inside the flags and I'm halfway towards New Zealand, it's not going to be that smart. You, know, you still need some self-protection. And so that's what I think in a really complicated world is that I'm sorry to say, I'm not, no, I'm not sitting on the fence. What I'm saying is we regulate where we can and that is being moved towards, but in my opinion, at the end of the day, the community's ultimate safety, if we're going to live for decades and decades in retirement or whatever you want to call it, I'd prefer financial independence, the simple truth is money is so complicated and it's going to be so fundamentally important because we're living so much longer and we want to live so much better. That, in my opinion, is a challenge. I don't think our politicians are going to solve it particularly well, and it's going to be a fairly painful process. And like our medical system, stuff's going to go wrong. At the end of the day, I think trying to be responsible for your own health is a great, great saying. At the end of the day, I think being responsible for your money, no one will care more than you. And that's my last word on the subject. Thank you for being so patient with me.
Thank you very much, Paul. I'm sure you'll appreciate the, um, the insight uh, that we've had this evening from, uh, from Paul's lecture. Now, Paul has uh, agreed to take some questions, and there are a couple of Rode microphones. So if, you're, if you'd like to ask Paul a question, can I ask you to stick your hand up, and we'll get a microphone to you. So I've got one, two, three. Can I take one here first? Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for a very inspiring uh, talk. Um, Bill McKibben, the, the Harvard environmentalist and writer, was on the ABC this week, and he's here in Australia on a, on a tour to try and drum up support for a campaign of disinvestment in fossil fuel companies. Do you think that campaign is going to work? And, and, and uh, uh, or, or would you like to... Comment in some way on that? Oh, gee, you know, gee, you've got me a beauty here. I was hoping that wouldn't come up. Um, you know, gee, that's crikey, I find this issue hard. Um, look, I've got to tell you, look, let me be completely truthful with you. Um, a lot of my personal money is probably invested in areas that it really shouldn't be. I try and avoid tobacco companies, okay? And I'm so challenged by this whole debate around ethics and investment environment. And it may not be the environment. You see, that, that might be so. Uh, one of the great, we had the, um, had those with, I got invited along to a, um, a Catholic church thing recently about, um, I, I'm not a Catholic, by the way. They wanted a, just wanted someone in. And, um, um, and uh, it doesn't, my, my wife's Catholic, no problem at all, but I'm Anglican. But uh, the debate was where to invest our money. And, uh, and they said, oh, I said, what don't you like? And they said, fossil fuels are terrible. Smoking's terrible, alcohol's terrible, prostitution's terrible. And I said, what about, oh, property's fine. Well, but what if that major building has got two floors of a fossil fuel company in it? And they went, oh, we can't be having that. And I said, okay, what if there's a liquor shop in the bottom? They said, we can't be having that. And I said, well, Jesus, um, how do you like term deposits? And they went, well, doesn't the bank lend to all those people? And I went, well, yes, they do. And, and I'm not trying to be silly here. It, it, it is a really, oh, sorry, it is, it is a really challenging issue for me. The, the hope that I have is that the hope that I have is that the market ends up working. In that a company that is green, if that company is to be our future, you'd like to think it's going to be successful. And so for mine, I'm afraid to say I'm I'm going to have to cop out on this one a bit, because basically I, I if someone just says to me it's just fossil fuels, I can kind of deal with that. And if you live with the fact that BHP is in a building that you're a part investor in and they are a fossil fuel person, you've got to live with that bit as well. In a sense, you're profiting from them doing fossil fuels. So I've got to test you on, you kind of got to help me with what ethical framework do you want. And, and I, can, I can get you, yeah. but at the end of the day, as we did with this Catholic church group, we, we actually literally ended up deciding that you can't, kind of need to put in a tin can and bury it. And then, then the trustee said, but bloody hell, we can't, we can't run schools. And I said, well, well, yeah, I, 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 I hear you. So, so it's very challenging for me, depending. If you just say, I just, I just don't want fossil fuels, what I am hoping is that, is that at the end of the day, the only thing that will work with humans, in my opinion, is at the end of the day, I rather suspect that my great hope is, is that the companies who are doing non-environmentally friendly, ethically appropriate, will be very successful and their shares will rise in value. The trouble is if I say to someone, look, here's a great company, but you're going to lose money, they just don't do it. So I'm hoping that as we move down that route, I need those companies to be, and there are some actually quite good green managed funds out there that are only investing green and actually are doing okay, by the way. But none of us are going to give away our bottle of Chardonnay in retirement, and that's the challenge. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a hard one, isn't it? But, but, but clearly the world's got to change. And then, so then, you know, for example, I got a really rude letter from someone recently. I was talking about uh, wind farms, for example. And, oh, jeez, I shouldn't have mentioned that on ABC. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a whole bunch of people saying that's appalling and it's killing birds and it's dreadful. And, and uh, I'm struggling, OK? I'm just a simple money person. Well, the ABC just did a, a, a feature on wind farms saying they're now actually making money with wind farms. Yeah, so but... Yeah, but yes, but yeah, absolutely they are. But but I've got I've got some really some farmers saying they're an appalling, they're a blot on the environment, they're destroying our lifestyle, they're killing birds. So I, I'm only this is this is a I, I'm I'm sounding like a fence sitter. Um, I I want to see money going into these, but I'm hoping people will go in for 
at the end of the day, if they don't make money, we're going to lose all of our money and that's a problem. This is where, look, in the major industry here is major superannuation funds. And one of their greatest concerns is major superannuation funds poll their members and their members say only buy environmentally friendly investments. The super fund then gets them in, into a focus group. I don't run one of these things. Uh, the fo they get them into a focus group and they say, look, that's fine, but you'll probably lose 10% per annum of your money. Or you won't make as much if you go the other way. And then everyone changes their mind. It's a really challenging issue. Hard one. Okay, I'm going to move on. So there's two questions over here. These are great talks. Um, I'm probably one of the least financially uh, sensible people here. Excellent. Where should I look? Where should I look? Uh, yeah, look, what I, what I strongly, in terms of information, um, you know, the advice industry hates me for this, but, you know, most of us don't really need an advisor. Uh, if you say you're at base level, I'd really love you to go to the government's Money Smart website. Uh, the Money Smart website, and the re we taxpayers pay for it. The advantage, and, and I know the government we're here to help you sounds a bit terrifying, okay? I, from where the government, for heaven's sake. But the Money Smart website um, is over a million people in there. And you see, I, I just fundamentally believe, and I give advisors grief about this the whole time, the idea that an advisor is going to make us rich has got to be nonsense because the advisor is probably not rich and they're probably working for a living. And so what I find is that what makes people your age rich? Spending less than you earn. And what I'd really like you to do, and you may have done all this stuff, so, but I'd really like you to go on and do a real, on, on Money Smart, it's a free budget planner, it won't sell you anything, it's got nothing to sell. But if you go on and, and actually take a look at your cash flow, take a look at some goals and objectives, see, I, this is where you get into vested interest. The reality is, if I'm talking to a, a share salesman about what to invest in, what are they going to tell me? If I talk to a property person, what are they going to tell me? But you see, if you step back and look at, this is where Macquarie Uni is fantastic, genuine research. If you step back and look at some of the research is that in Australia, a reasonably well-located property or a reasonable share do roughly the same. But if, if you've got an 18% credit card debt, well, I'd like you to just get a bit of extra, you know, try and find 20 bucks a week and get rid of it. You know, I, I'm still finding Australians have got $270 billion in the bank in no interest accounts and $50 billion in credit card debt at 18%. Now, I'm not saying they're the same people. I, I know they're, you know, I'm playing with statistics here. But the number of people who come to me and say, oh, Paul, I've got five grand and a 2% account, oh, and I've got an 18% credit card with five grand on it. So, like, like what? So, look, basically for me, it, it's not as hard as we think. The Australian population is growing. We have an undersupply of housing, and basically, with a growing population, with no death duties, the wealth in the community, it may be up and down. So if you were to say to me, hey, Paul, I've done my numbers carefully, I can afford to borrow this, I can afford to buy a property in a reasonable area, I'm doing it with a 25-year view, I'm not over-borrowing, I'd say, well, look, you might hate me in three years' time because it might be no good over three years. You'll love me in 20. Uh, with shares, you might want to say, well, look, you know, I might buy a few banks, you know, buy a few Woolies, you know, whatever you might want to do, buy a few BHP. Uh, but basically, again, you may hate me in three years. Because let's not forget that only in the last five years now, Commonwealth Bank shares have gone from 54 bucks down to 24 bucks, back up to nearly 70 bucks, and down a bit at the moment. So the volatility is enormous. So for mine, I work with all sorts of people who are wealthy and all sorts of people who are poor, and the only thing I find in common is I work with a lot of work with a lot of people, particularly with my my government financial counselling hat on, work with lots of folks who don't earn a lot of money who are well off, and I work with a lot of rich folk who are really poor. The only difference, the only thing I see in common, it ain't what you earn, it's what you spend. And I, I, and I wish I could make it easier for you. So basically it is about, I need you to have a strategy to spend less than you earn and don't get into the debate about should it be property, should it be shares. I actually don't care, as long as you do something. And, and that, that will make the difference. One of the first things said on the money program, you might have seen it, oh God, back in a million years ago, 1993. And I just said to people, oh for heaven's sake, look, just, just put just put 20 bucks a week extra in your mortgage. And back then Australians went, huh? What's 20 bucks going to do? And the number of times I get people walking up to me saying, you know, well, thank you for that. And I said, why are you saying that? Said, well, you, you said that about, um, you said that, uh, it was about 18 years ago, I, said, I was really pushing that line. And they said, well, you know, our 25 year mortgage, we paid it off in 18 years with that 20 bucks extra. And now we've got two grand a month left over and we're having a trip, thanks for that. So you see, it's a, that's why I hate people who pretend miracles. So don't go to a seminar that's going to make you rich quick or you know, what, all this sort of crap. Uh, now, if you want to get really rich quick, run the seminars and rip off other people. <laughs>
Oh, no, that's genius. Oh, no, no, that's genius stuff. Oh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a cracker get-rich-quick scheme. Okay, thank you. Have we got time for one more? Just on those get-rich-quick um, seminars, don't you think there should be uh, uh, some regulation to stop people screwing? Because I think with an ageing population, there's a lot of baby boomers who've got inadequate savings Correct. for retirement, and they're desperate to be told what they want to hear. That is, there's a miracle out there. Look, let me also, the, the media is really big, and you'll see this, um, that when you see... Uh, retirees in particular who get ripped off. Um, the media is very big on the fact they're greedy. In my experience, they're not greedy. They're actually needy. They, their term deposits gone from 8% to 4%. Um, you know, we, we all know the deal. We're a proud group of people, okay? I, I know mums and dads who put roast on for the kids on Sunday, and that's the only meat in the house for the week. You know, I, it, it is so, so if someone says to you, uh, you know, a smooth talking sort of, oh, look, you're 4% from the bank, Look, I can get you 8% on property, you know, and it's mezzanine finance and, you know, and, and all this sort of crap. Um, I actually don't think they're greedy when they're chasing that. You know, I don't think the people in banks here in Victoria were greedy in, in, any, in, any, in any scope. So, 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 so the, the problem that the, 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 problem that the regulators are having, though, is the only spruker we've really ever managed to do anything with. The guy, Henry Kay was the guy spruking fly free to Queensland and buy a property. And the only reason that ASIC managed to shut him down was he, uh, he mentioned the word ASIC approved in an ad. And they got him on a technicality. He ripped off something like 15,000 people, lost most of their life savings. Um, and so the spruking thing is incredibly... We're back to definitional. So if I say to you, OK, well, look, um, here's a term deposit at 4%. I reckon if you buy a bank share, I, I reckon their dividend at about 6% fully franked is higher. But let me tell you all the risks. Bank shares are expensive at the moment. Let's look at Commonwealth Bank over the last five years, $54, $24, $70. Um, now, if Australian housing prices go down, I think our bank, which I don't think they're going to do, by the way, in any big sense, the population growth is going to override it, and I'd give you that as a bit of a disclaimer, but I'm probably going to say, you know, but gee, you know, if this is nowhere near as safe as a term deposit, and let's do it with a small part of your money, you know, I don't think I should be banned for telling you that. You know, I, I, I don't really think, like, tonight it's an information seminar, I don't think I should be banned for doing this. Um, and the trouble is, is the bloody weasels, if they were promising you 60% um, per annum, we can generally get them under false and deceptive, the ACCC in particular. Um, you know, and, and by the way, for those of you who want a real laugh, you'll see these in the papers at the moment, people offering, uh, you know, the, you buy the computer software, usually pay about 12 grand, go to a training program, you're gonna make 60% per annum. You go home, one, go home and put $100,000 into your computer, you can't do it in a calculator, it's not big enough, put in 60% per annum, you actually end up owning all of the planet inside my lifetime. Look, 60% compound is just damn fantastic. I even get cranky with, so is John McGrath of McGrath, probably he's a mate of mine, I get him on radio with me, is John McGrath spruiking when he says property will double in value every seven years? You go, hmm, is that spruiking? And he goes, every seven years. You all know the rule of 72. Whenever someone promises you something, if they say it's going to double in value in seven years, you divide it into 72, it's going to double in about 10 years. And you think Sydney property doubled in 10 years. Yeah, it might be okay. So I say to John on radio recently, so John, what's the average price in Sydney? He says 600,000. I'm like, okay, so you're saying in about seven years, 10% per annum, it could be 1.2 million. And John goes, wow, possible. Yeah, it's happened in Sydney, you know what the Sydney property market's like, it tends to be dog-like, dog-like, dog-like. And we've all had those gains, by the way. Um, and then I say, okay, John, so seven years after that, it's 2.4. And he goes, I see where this is going. Seven years after that, it's 4.8, let's call it 5 million. Seven years later, it's 10, 20, 40, 80, 163, 20, 640, one point. So I said, John, so in my youngest daughter's lifetime, the average price for property in Sydney is going to be 1.2 billion. And he says, well, that's bloody ridiculous. And I said, well, if it's going to, if it's going to double every seven years, it, it, of course it's... So, uh, and he actually... It is kind of spruiking, isn't it? And I, I'm just not sure how... I think we're better off giving you this... You know anyway. But I think we're better off giving people what I call a better crap detector. 
I'm not sure, because the trouble is, is that if we try and get rid of risk or we... So, I mean, you know, bluntly, I would probably banned from doing this to talk tonight. I might be spruiking. I might be talking deceptive crap. I hope, I hope I'm not talking deceptive crap. Um, but um, that's the challenge. Where's the, where's the line? And no country in the world has had much success at all with people running get rich quick and you know, blah, blah. And, and then, then if we bring in regulations about disclosing risk, then, then they disclose the risk across the bottom in fine print. And it's like the magic weight pill. I, look, I don't know about you folks. My wife would like me to eat broccoli. I'd rather eat pizza and take the magic weight pill. We're all susceptible to the magic pill. We really are. So again, I just don't think we're going to succeed in regulating spruiking because I don't think we can tightly define whether I'm spruiking tonight and should be locked in jail or whether I'm doing my best to tell you what I think is the truth. Uh, very fine, isn't it? Professor. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> No, I don't really want to go to jail, and um, I don't think we've heard any crap tonight, so my crap detector is rested for this evening. So can I, uh, can I uh, ask you to join me in thanking Paul for a very uh, inspirational and very entertaining lecture.